Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, you can see how we could easily be mistaken for each other, right? So, um, so just uh, I think we're we're just going to have kind of like an open conversation here about like test evaluation and different methods of doing that, using uh, focusing on the user and then focusing on like uh, taking lessons learned from cyber defense towards uh, AI assurance. Uh, just by quick background, so uh, I was a Marine for 12 years. Uh, last few of those years was spent standing up the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center with Dr. Pinellas and uh, Trevor here, and a couple of others that I think are around that were there at the very beginning. Um, left active duty and been, sca been at scale for about three years now. So, And my name is Alex Levinson. I'm SCALE's head of security. I've been here for a little over three years. My career prior to scale was primarily focused in technical cyber operations. Um, I have a lot of experience in offensive security and, and offensive red team, uh, both as a consultant and internal to private enterprise. Um, I've really spent the bulk of my career looking at how we can use red teaming and penetration testing as a measurement tool to understand and quantify cyber and risk. Awesome. Uh, um, let's kick it off. Dan, I'd love to understand from you You've lived it for a long time, like as you were standing up the Jake and your time here at scale. You see the technology um, in the field. What, how do you see test and evaluation solving problems that exist in that? Yeah, so I think that you know the the key part here, and this is where like I think that you know the discussion between you and I are going to be it's going to be really fruitful, is that there's a way to look at it where you're just looking at the model, you're looking at it from the technologies from a very like bespoke perspective. And then there's looking at it from the human system. And how does the workflow adapt? How does the AI best enable the human? How does the human's uh, workflow correct for some of those challenges with the AI system? So in some of the experiences that Scale has had in terms of fielding large language models or computer vision to the, uh, to the operational forces, and even in you know, smaller scale experiments like what we do with uh, CSIS and some of the, the team down at Marine Corps University, is we evaluate how well this it is actually supporting their workflow. So there's a doctrine, there's a workflow that already exists. By fielding this technology to them, we start to see how they are going to how that workflow and doctrine will adapt to best leverage the technology. And that's a little bit different than looking at it from just you know what's the best F1 score or is this large language model uh, is it going to give me a ton of hallucinations or fewer hallucinations? It's looking at it of how can it be useful even if it's not perfect. Um, I think you like from your perspective though, like taking it from the lessons learned from cyber defense and how that can be applied to looking at the AI model and the software specifically. Like, are there lessons learned from like cyber defense that you can then carry over to AI assurance? I, this, certainly, I feel like I'm living in Groundhog Day because for 20 years we've gone through this journey of how to make computer systems more secure. And now we're starting all over again with how do we make AI systems, uh, we say more secure, but really it's about risk management. Um, we, a good way to frame it, I think, is through a very simple concept of security called defense in depth. When we look at an AI system, it's not just the model, it's not just the user, it's not just the system. It's what are we using the model for, to what purpose, and then applying controls at every layer to get risk not zeroed, because that'll never happen with a computer system. But to getting it to a place where it's acceptable for us to say, if something, I have controls if something goes terribly wrong to keep that blast radius small, I have continuous monitoring in place to know that if something does go wrong, I can react to it quickly and mitigate it. And if something new and, and a new invention or a new vulnerability comes along that, that wasn't in my calculus before, I can react to that. That same maturity is what we've, we've we've evolved over the last 20 years in cyber, that same world is going to come about here, I believe, with AI. So, you know, defense in depth, and that's something that I think, you know, anyone with a military background is familiar with, right? You right. don't rely on a single thing to test. You, you right. test multiple factors. And you have a framework that kind of helps to build out that, frame, that, that defense in depth. Do you find that that framework is, uh, does that adapt? by a lot when you deal with one workflow versus another or one use case versus another? Yeah, I, I don't think it does. But I think there's a really key point to make. You look at something like NIST AI RMF. It's a fantastic paper to guide you through how to 
how to think about whether AI is a risky technology or not. What I think we're currently lacking and what I think is variable is while the framework is static, how you apply it is going to differ from technology to technology to application to application. Mm. So things like you might really care about hallucination, as you brought up, in this context because this is a uh, very close to the user AI uh, co-pilot. But you might not care about hallucination in like a, an application that is, is like a classifier. We're using LM as, as a pseudo classifier in a mm -hmm. sense. No, that makes sense. So like depending on how close to the user in some cases and also like the mission impact and 100%. using that to help drive the, which framework or how you apply that framework to that use case. Correct. So I think I could think of examples where in like from a DOD perspective or some of the use cases that we've seen with exercises or operational forces is there's actually, uh, in some cases, it's beneficial to have the temperature kind of ranked a little bit higher and the hallucinations kind of flowing because it allows for almost like a uh, method of kind of querying your own thought process and like providing an outside opinion. So my point is that even with the use case and using that framework that you have, there might be worth, there might be specific use cases where you know, the risk is low and, the, and as long as the workflow is understood, of you are actually trying to get this thing to provide more kooky responses, it could still benefit the overall mission. I, I think it does. One of the things that we, we see in red teaming is, and this is why you never see human, computers completely replace humans in red teaming, is because there's a certain creativeness, there's a certain illogical aspect of red teaming hmm. that a human is very good at replicating where a computer wants to be very perfect, wants to follow a strict methodology, wants to follow its programming. Mm -hmm. A human can push a button that says do not push this in a way that a computer struggles to do. And so I think um, I think having human in the loop when you're considering these sorts of test and evaluation cases is actually really important um, in the context of AI. So human in the loop for testing. Absolutely. So uh, where do you think like hold out data sets come into place when it comes to being able to test these large language models? Again, I'll bring it back to the cyber use case. We've, just because we have human in the loops on cyber vulnerability assessment does not mean that that person, that, that human isn't using a vast swath of software and tooling mm. to scan, to do, to do vulnerability scanning, to do static code analysis. All of these things are tools but the human is often the one directing and distilling and thinking about next steps in that. I think that when we think about benchmark data sets, those, those are going to be key points to building that, that toolbox of assessment, but you'll still need a, humor to, a human to sit there and, and weave it together in the bespoke way that's applicable to the technology. No, I think that makes sense. And I think that, like you know, it's, it's, again, looking at it from an operational perspective, we don't field any piece of technology without a human in the loop. We don't like the DOD, the military as a whole, because typically like the, the competitive advantage that the United States military maintains is creative officers, well-educated force, uh, you know, professional staff NCOs. And so to cut them out of the system and replace them with an AI makes almost no sense. Very similar to the approach that you're talking about and being able to do robust test and evaluation or red teaming yeah. from, uh, from that perspective. Totally. Um, where do you see, where do you see the the technology progressing? Because, like, what does test and evaluation get us that, that we're not at today? What sort of gates does that unlock? Yeah, so I think that that's that's key, right? So being able to understand the left and right lateral limits of the of any technology that we use or any system that we use, then allows you to be informed when you develop those workflows and those and the new doctrine to support its application. So I understand that like at, you know, to use a computer vision approach, one of the projects that I worked on when I was at the Jake was uh, a force protection system. If we were to test that in such a way that we understand that at certain times of the day when the shadows get long, the models start to fail, well then what we could do is we can adjust the workflow and we can adjust the, the way that it's employed so that we know that at dusk, you, man, you, you have to not rely on the system and you have to go back to standard manning for your, your defense post. Um, but it doesn't mean that just because the system isn't perfect that it's not useful. And the way that you correct for that not perfectness is making sure that you have a human in the loop and you're continually adapting that workflow to best leverage technology. One of the things that I've seen 
in my time here is as we're trying to put this technology in the hands of the department, in the hands of the public sector, you often have the individuals supporting the mission who know exactly how the technology is going to affect them, but then they've got to ship this off to a group that's doing, you know, the authorizing official that's mm -hmm. that's saying, yeah, I certify this stuff. And that individual often is not directly involved in the mission. And currently, I think authorizing officials throughout the U.S. government don't have the toolbox and knowledge they need to look at a system that's, quote, AI enabled and say, yeah, I understand the risk. I accept this amount of risk. Here are the things I need done to mitigate risks that I find unacceptable. And to be able to move those things across their desk. I think fielding technology in public sector is about the efficiency of that authorizing official. Again, we don't need to remove the risk management layer. We want to make it as efficient as possible so that technology is continuing to be fielded. Um, again, I think NIST's work is fantastic here. I think CIS's work in, in some of their guidance on AI has been really helpful. I do think there's still a gap, though, in what's driving, what's slowing down current adoption because we don't have the, the tooling framework and methodologies in the hands of those folks who are the ultimate signers of risk. Yeah, no, makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and, you know, trying to get through that hurdle so yeah. that we can actually field the technology in a yeah. responsible way so that we learn more and then can inform that, that you know, that AO's workflow or that, uh, that cyber accepted service kind of like methodology is, uh, is something that I think, you know, we're looking forward to continuing to kind of like push the bounds of where that is. Um, I think with that, like maybe if there's any questions from uh, the group that you might want to ask or if there's anything that, you know, you want to dive down a little bit deeper, perhaps it'd be better than just listening to us talk the entire time. <laughs> Somebody asked me first, yes. Um, there was a, um, um, can you talk a little bit about the, the WMD benchmark and why it's important? There was some talk in the, in the, in the article about building benchmarks to detect cyber, potential information that could support cyber attacks, um, uh, information in the models that could help facilitate building out of biological weapons. Can you talk a little bit about building benchmarks for specific team use cases of why it's a, uh, why it's a challenge and why it's important. Yeah, um, uh, happy you brought that up. I, I, I feel very proud that my name is on an academic paper. I will say there is some math in that paper that is well beyond the letters after my name, which are none. Um, <laughs> but be, I was a part of the data collection and building of that data set. And, and I'll tell you this, what the paper really proved to me was that the value that we're going to build as, an, uh, as a society around AI and understanding risk management of AI, while building AI is nice, the value is ultimately going to be the building of data sets that let us understand what the AI is and is not capable of. So that benchmark was made to test the guardrails that might be in place in order to keep biological weapons and cyber um, offensive cyber um, security, call it, uh, knowledge out of an end user's capabilities. And I think that is an example of really, you look at the macro of that, the benchmark, the, the application was just, you know, kind of picked because we could do that. But the, the application is really to say, given a benchmark with a certain very good high fidelity set of knowledge applied to a use case, a la we don't want it to do X, we could evaluate that in a way that we found efficacy in. And I think that you know, doing risk assessment is all about doing your due diligence and having a benchmark tailored to the use case that you're testing for, which could be positive or negative. You could be testing to say, this is good at math or it isn't good at math. You still need a, a benchmark to be able to identify its ability to perform math. Um, I think that that really should be the takeaway for anybody looking at this paper is that benchmarks are the future and the more bespoke your application of AI is, the more bespoke of benchmark testing you're going to need in the process. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for listening to us drone on for a few minutes. Um, hopefully it was uh, interesting. And then uh, I think what we're going to do is we'll set up next for the, uh, the follow-on um, panel. Cool. Thank right. you. Thanks.